He was absolutely certain. And he was absolutely right. The guy he saw was the guy he suspected. On February 23, 2020, Greg McMichael was reupholstering boat cushions on the bed of his truck, parked in his driveway, using it as a workbench, pointed out towards his street in the direction he was looking. A quiet street in a quiet neighborhood. In the midday sun on a pleasant February day in 2020 here in Brunswick, Georgia, when a young man ran past him at a sprint. He was, as Greg described him to police that day, and you've heard it now several times, his words, hauling ass. The young man had it hooked up, Greg said. Running at a sprint, as Greg reported to police that same afternoon, he wasn't out for no Sunday jog. That man was the same man whom Greg and others, neighbors, Greg's own son, Travis, had seen in that house just a few doors down from his house on Satilla Drive, the house under construction, where surveillance videos, first one, then a couple, and then several, had video recorded him, as you've seen and heard. Not once or twice, but four times at night. Not in the bright light of day, but in the dark of night. So what did Greg believe he was doing, this man, in the house on those occasions? What did he think he was doing? Well, Larry English, the owner of the house, had described him to police as plundering around. That same man, Larry English, had reported this to 911 to Greg's neighbors, and to the Glenn County police officer, Robert Rash. And it got to Greg McMichael. This same man who had been captured on surveillance video, as Mr. Rubin told you, infrared lighting, it's lit up for us to see, but if you were the person in that house in the dark of night, you wouldn't see anything except possibly the little red infrared lights of a camera, if that. Inside that house where, so Greg had been repeatedly told by Larry English, Diego Perez, Officer Robert Rash, where he had been told that thousands of dollars of electronic equipment had gone missing, stolen, from a boat not visible to any camera. And so when Greg McMichael said later to police he had not seen him take anything, well, the camera wasn't on that boat from which all the items were taken. And this happened in a neighborhood that had experienced break-ins and burglaries and thefts over many months. And you saw some of those Facebook postings the neighbors had put up. The same guy that Officer Rash had canvassed the neighborhood with a screenshot of him from one of those surveillance cameras asking people knocking on their doors and asking them, have you seen this man? Do you know this man? Showed the screenshot of him to Greg McMichael. That same guy that Officer Rash told Greg McMichael, nobody in the neighborhood knows him, nor had ever seen him before in that neighborhood. 
And then in December, Officer Rash sent a text to homeowner Larry English. And this is what he told him. Your neighbor at 229 Satilla Drive, and it's actually 230 Satilla Drive, is Greg McMichael. Greg is retired law enforcement and also a retired investigator from the DA's office. He said, please call him day or night when you get action on your camera. His number is, and he gives him his cell phone number. The same guy in that house that Greg's son Travis saw with his own eyes. At that house yet again, the night of February 11, 2020, just 12 days before the tragic events that bring us here to this courtroom. And on that occasion, as you've heard already, when Travis saw that same man, he made that furtive movement to his pocket in the dark of night in a situation and circumstance that made Travis think, as you've heard, he might have a gun. And of course, he reported that to his dad, who also thought he may have had a gun that night. A signal to both of these men, that movement, that this man may be armed. So on February 23, 2020, 12 days after that night, when Greg McMichael saw Ahmaud Arbery sprint past him on that sunny Sunday afternoon, not only did Greg recognize him as the same guy he also believed from the manner of his running, sprinting, and the direction from which he ran, the English house to his left and past him on Satilla Drive deeper into the neighborhood, that as he told police later that same day, he thought he was running from someone or something, that he was being chased just by the manner in which he was running, sprinting. He thought that he had just been spotted, he told the police, in someone's house. In or around someone, perhaps harming someone. Law enforcement trained and experienced for 30 years. Greg noted specific features that he saw as this running man ran past him that matched precisely the man he'd seen on surveillance video before. Young, black, male, five feet, 10 inches, slender, muscular, with short hair that Greg described as dread, short dreads, twists, wearing a white t-shirt. There might be a chance, finally, Greg thought, as he told the police later that day, for the police to question this man, to find out, who are you? Why are you here? No one in the neighborhood knows you. And we've had all of these problems in our neighborhood specifically at that house, but at many other houses. A man who had eluded police up till then, as Greg said to the police later that day, no one could ever, ever catch him, he said to Officer Brandeberry, on the street, at the scene, that day. If only he could be detained long enough, Greg thought, long enough for the police to arrive. So, there using his truck as a workbench, Greg dropped his tools, left his project, ran into his house, called out to his son Travis, the same guy is back, the same guy is back, let's go. 
believing that he was the man who had burglarized Larry English's house, believing that Larry English's house had in fact been burglarized. He had never been told anything different, never been told there were other places Larry English had taken his boat where his stuff might have been taken. He had never been told anything different, believing that he may be armed, wearing pants with pockets. Greg grabbed his gun, Travis too, and they piled into Travis's truck, parked there at the house near Greg's truck, and you can see it on video, you'll see it later. They piled into the truck, Travis in the driver's seat, and as you've already heard, Greg, all 230 pounds of him then, he's smaller now, stuffed into a child's car seat, and really not into it, but on top of it. His face almost in the windshield as he's sitting on top of this car seat, strapped into the passenger seat. He couldn't just snatch it out and then jump in and sit in the seat. It was locked in. And as they pulled out to the street to turn right to pursue this running man, that they suspected to be a burglar. There stood down the street, not very far away, Matt Albenzi. Matt Albenzi, you've heard, and you'll hear from him. A man who had walked up his street, had seen Ahmaud Arbery in the house, had taken his cell phone, had called the police, and while standing near a tree, looking at the house, locked eyes with Ahmaud Arbery, who ducked down and then came out of the house, and you saw the still photo, was off, running. And when Greg and Travis got into Travis's truck, and we all know this, speech occurs not only with the words that come from our mouth, but with the expressions on our face, the hand signals we give, many of which we know, speak words. Matt Albenzi, who was walking up the street, went like that to Travis and Greg. There he goes. In fact, he's saying on the 911 call that he's on. There he goes. He's running. Waving his arm in a motion that conveyed a clear message to these men that he is the same guy. Matt Albenzi had seen and heard about this guy in that house too. There he goes, the same man. In just a few short minutes, they would catch up to Ahmaud Arbery on Burford. You saw the one still photo from Mr. Bryan's house, the motion detected photo of the truck and Mr. Arbery. They would catch up to him and they would have the conversations Mr. Rubens just replayed for you and that you'll hear in this case on Burford Road. Tell him to stop. We want to talk to you. Tell him the police have been called. And when Ahmad Arbery turned ultimately from them without saying a word and ran back the way he'd come, Travis stopped his truck. Greg took that opportunity to get himself out of that car seat and climbed the best he could into the bed of the truck where there's a toolbox that he could sit on. And there he sat, and as Travis drove the direction that has been described, the opposite direction from Ahmad Arbery, who has by now run back to Satilla Drive, while Travis and Greg drive the opposite direction to Zellwood Drive. They're going in opposite directions. And Mr. Arbery is turning back in the direction from which he had come. Mr. Bryan is behind him, watching him, 
apparently. And Travis drives his truck around Zellwood, not knowing, not knowing which way Ahmaud Arbery would run, not knowing that he would turn off Satilla and run down Holmes and up on Holmes, Travis turns. And Ahmaud Arbery and Travis McMichael with Greg in the truck, now in the back of the truck, pass each other like this. And ultimately, and you'll hear more details throughout the case, Travis parks the truck, stops, and Ahmaud Arbery is out of sight around that dog leg you've seen. And there stood Greg in the back of the truck. And you've heard already from Mr. Rubin that Travis thought Greg had called 911. Greg didn't have a phone on him. Travis dialed it and handed it to his father. And that's where you see him standing in the bed of Travis's truck, looking back now towards Ahmaud Arbery, who's turned around when you saw the video earlier when the state played it. When Mr. Arbery turns around, he turns back toward the McMichaels. They're already stopped up on Holmes. They're already there. They've passed him. And they're now waiting for the police to come keeping an eye out for which direction he may go. They can't even see him, and then here he comes back. And there's Greg with his phone to his ear on the 911 call, and as Ahmad runs towards the truck on the video we've all seen, that's been seen everywhere, that you're gonna see many times, no doubt, in this trial, he's on the phone. He's describing to the person at 911 where they are best he can. He doesn't even know the name of the street. He just tells them Satilla Shores near his house. And then you hear him as Ahmad gets close to the back of the truck. You hear him yell, stop right there. Damn it. Stop. And then the next thing you hear and the last word you hear him say on that phone is, Travis! Because by then, Greg has turned as, as Ahmaud Arbery is running past the truck and he sees him turn towards his only son. He drops that phone to the floor of the truck, in the bed of the truck. He's now in abject fear that he is about to witness his only son possibly be shot and killed in front of his very eyes. And then that man did something so unexpected to Greg McMichael, so incomprehensible to him, he turned sharp left. He didn't cut right, go across the yard, to Satilla Shores and down the street and on his way. The direction, as you've heard, is the only way into that neighborhood with police on the way. No, he turned left towards a man with a shotgun. And he was on Travis instantly. Clearly, it seemed, to Greg McMichael, attempting to take the gun from his son. And as any reasonable person would believe, he would take that gun if he could and he would use it to shoot his son. The what happened in this case will, for the most part, though there will be some dispute, but for the most part, be without dispute. The facts, the what happened in this case. The why it happened is what this case is about. This case turns on intent, beliefs, knowledge, reasons for those beliefs, 
whether they were true or not. Were there good reasons to believe them? Were there good reasons to believe that this young man, Ahmaud Arbery, had been in this house where things had been taken and that he may have been the person who took them? Were there good reasons to believe that as he ran past Greg McMichael that day, that he was fleeing from someone or something who had seen him in that house or near that house, which turned out to be exactly what happened. That afternoon, after the tragedy unfolded that we're here for, Greg sat down to give a lengthy interview to police officer Parker Marcy. And officer Marcy asked Greg, and these are his words, what was your intent should this guy have stopped? Greg's answer, to hold him till, till you come check him out. There was no doubt in my mind, having seen the videos, who this guy was. Still quoting, my intention was to stop this guy so he could be arrested or be identified at the very least. On that day, at that place, at that time, Greg McMichael was absolutely sure this was the guy. The same guy he had seen on surveillance videos. Inside a house multiple times where Greg had sound reasons to believe. Theft had occurred, burglary. Greg was absolutely sure. He was absolutely certain. His suspicions were well founded. And I'm a criminal defense lawyer. I've been doing this a long time. And I consider a room like this, an American courtroom, to be practically a sacred place. It's in here that the facts will unfold for you. It's in this room where you will decide the truth. And ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you the truth of this case is that Greg McMichael is not guilty of any of these crimes.